Thank you for joining Antelope Christian Center. We believe in the power of worship and the power of foundation of faith upon God's Word. Our vision and our ministry is built upon loving God and loving others. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, verse number 1. As we're reading through and studying the book of Revelations, this morning I want to begin in verse 1. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Pastor Avellano has copies of the New Living Translations, and if you would like one because you want to follow along in that translation, you just lift your hand and he'll bring it to you. It sounds like this. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. In other words, he said, I'm going to show you all the things that are going to happen. He sent an angel to present the revelation to his servant, John, John the beloved disciple. John, who was the fisherman that had become the apostle. Father God, we bow our heart before you this morning. Lord, as we open our Bibles, we open our hearts. We invite the Holy Spirit. Lord, we know the Bible is anointed, but we invite the Holy Spirit to anoint our hearts that we might hear, that we might see in your word what you are doing in our world today in Jesus name amen it's called the book of revelation question does the bible speak about the apocalypse does the bible speak about the apocalypse there is much that has been written in both fantasy and turned into movies in Hollywood all about the apocalypse. Here, I raise the question as we come to the final book in the Bible, is there anything in all the Bible or in the book of Revelation that speaks about the apocalypse? Well, the answer is yes, but it's a little complicated. You see, the word revelation is an English word that comes to us through the ancient language of the Greeks. In Greek, the word is apocalypse. And it was translated later in the early church years in Latin. And today it comes to us in English as the book of Revelation. Years ago, in about 1999, I was in Philippi, Greece, and I had been invited to preach. The church in Philippi. I stood before the congregation and I had a New Living Translation much like this one. And it was in English. And I preached in English. And I had what for some would be a man standing right next to me. It was a little awkward and a little annoying. Everything I said, he repeated. Everything. I would say something, pause, and then he would repeat it. I would say something else, and he re repeat it. I would read from the Bible, and he would repeat it. All of the people had Greek Bibles. All of the people spoke Greek, not English. The pastor of the church was my interpreter. He spoke English and Greek, and everything I said, he translated it from English into Greek. 
Their Bibles did not have the book of Revelation. Their Bibles had the book of Apocalypse. Why? Because that's the Greek word. The word apocalypse simply means to uncover or to unveil. Now, for hundreds and thousands of years, everyone knew what apocalypse meant, and everybody knew what revelation meant to reveal, to unveil, or to uncover. But two things happened. World War I and World War II, and Hollywood began to make movies. The writers of books, whether they're fiction or nonfiction, the people to develop these scripts for Hollywood spectacular movies. They hijacked the word apocalypse. And in the last 50 years, the last 70 years, the last 80 years, ever since World War II, the word apocalypse has taken a new cultural meaning. Most people don't understand that apocalypse simply means to unveil or to uncover. Today, people think of it as being doom and gloom and catastrophic destruction. Thank you, Hollywood. You know, words do that all the time. In 1952, if you use the word and you went to church and somebody said, how do you feel today? And you responded, I feel rather gay. But if you went to church in 2022 and you said the word gay, it has a totally different meaning. It happens with culture and what ex people experience. Words begin to shift. Now, the word study is a powerful way to study the Bible, but it has limitations. People say, I want to know the ancient Hebrew. I want to know the ancient Greek. I want to know what the Latin scholars wrote and the German scholars wrote. And finally, I come and I want to attack it from an English translation. I don't know if anybody ever told you this. I hate to think that I'm the first one that did. Jesus didn't speak English. He spoke Greek, he spoke Aramaic, and he spoke Hebrew. But when we come to the English language, we need to recognize that the meanings of things begin to shift. But the meaning of the Word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Somebody say amen. And what Jesus was saying to John is I am going to unveil to you. I'm going to reveal to you. I'm going to, I'm going to disclose what's going to happen in the days of head. As you look with me in chapter 1, verse 2, who faithfully reported everything he saw, underscore the word reported, this is his report, underscore the word report, of the word of God and the witness or the testimony of Jesus Christ. Verse 3, God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy. God blesses those who will listen to it. God blesses the one that will obey what it says. For the time is near. Blessings from the word of revelation or apocalypse or the uncovering. There are seven beatitudes in this book, and maybe you've never heard of that before because you've been focused in on the interpretation of Hollywood and the best-selling fiction book filled with fantasy about the end of the world. But let me bring you into the reality of the apocalypse or the unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ. This book of Revelation is a book of blessing and blessing and blessing and blessing and blessing. That's right. There are seven blessings. There are seven beatitudes found in the book of Revelation. 
if you are taking notes today, quickly write down Revelations chapter 1, verse 3, Revelations 14, verse 13, Revelation 16, verse 15, Revelation 19, verse 9, Revelations 20, verse 6, Revelations 22, verse 7, Revelation 22, verse 12. Now, I went rather quickly, but you have to understand I have limited time this hour. And if you didn't get all of those references down, you should. But you can find them because before you came in this morning, I made certain to post the Beatitudes of Revelation, the seven blessings, on the Antelope Christian Center Facebook page. So all of that detail, all of those scripture references, they're found right there. Blessed is the one that will listen, that will read, and that will heed this book. Blessed are those that stay awake and are looking for the coming of Christ. Blessed are those that are coming to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those that share in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed are those who keep my word. Blessed are those who wash their robes, oh, by the blood of Jesus. The Bible is a book. The Bible is a book, and it's filled with stories. The Bible is a book, and it's filled with blessings. It's kind of interesting. You might even use the word fascinating. It's kind of fascinating that there are two characteristics that are common to all books that have ever been written. Every book that's ever been written, the number one best-selling book or the book that nobody buys or maybe they've never read, they have two things in common. The book that is filled with fantasy and fiction or the textbook that is just meant to be read at the university or even the Bible, there are two characteristics that all books have. The first characteristic is found in chapter 1, paragraph 1, sentence 1. It is the beginning of the book. The biology university book or the best-selling Top Gun novel has a beginning of the story. And then it has the story and the second characteristic that is all the same is they all have the end. The beginning and the end. Before 1970, Walt Disney movies were not only popular and inspiring, but they were written, oftentimes inspired by specific scripture verses in the Bible. My favorite quote is from Thumper in the movie Bambi. People actually believe those words are in the Bible. Do you remember what the Apostle Thumper said in the movie Bambi? If my mama said, if you can't say something nice. Look at that. You know Bambi. These movies were built from the format. Once upon a time, a long time ago, in a faraway place. And then you got a family of river otters or beavers or puppies or little girls and little boys from Pollyanna to whatever in the beginning. And then you have the story and the drama and the journey until you get to the very, very end. And when you get to the very end of a Walt Disney movie produced prior to 1970, they all ended exactly the same. And they lived happily ever after. How many people remember those movies? Oh, yes. I long, I miss those movies. And they ended happily, and they lived happily ever after. I have news for you. I have news for you. The Bible has a beginning, and the Bible has an end. And at the end of the Bible, it's, and everybody lived happily ever after, ever, forever and ever and ever and ever. It's an eternal ending. There's so much drama in the story and the journey of faith through the Bible. 
There's so much drama from the very, very begin to the very, very end. We begin the book of Genesis, and maybe you've never considered this, but think about it today as we come to the book of Revelations. Think about it. Genesis begins with the rebellion of Satan. It begins with the sin of man. It begins with the stain of sin. It begins with the curse upon the life and the heart of man. Once upon a time, in a faraway place, A long, long, long time ago, there was rebellion in heaven. Satan was cast out. He brought that rebellion into paradise, the Garden of Eden, and man sinned, and the stain of sin brought a curse upon the land and upon the heart and the life of man. And man living under the curse and the stories are told from generations to generations, from Genesis to Revelation, the story is told of sin and disease and sickness and death and pain and suffering and sorrow and tears until you come to the last book of the Bible, until you come to the book of Acropolis, until you come to the book at the end of the Bible. And now you discover at the very, very end of the Bible that there is coming a day where the curse has been broken. There is a coming a day when there will be no more disease, that there'll be no more sickness, there'll be no more sorrow, there'll be no more pain, there'll be no more suffering, there'll be no more weeping. And death itself will be thrown into the eternal abyss, and you will walk on streets paved with gold. The Bible is a story with a beginning and an end. And this book has within it all of the events and all of the drama that's going to take us from the end of the world and all the way to the creation of a brand new world. You ask yourself the question in verse 4, who wrote this book? Who wrote this book? And the answer is, it was John the Apostle, the man that had been the fisherman, the man that had become a believer and a disciple and an apostle. Later, he would become a great preacher and a great evangelist. And today, when we think of John, we discover that he was a prophet. Who was he writing this book to? Chapter 1, verse 4. This letter is from John. That's the beloved disciple. This is the apostle John. This letter is from John the apostle, the beloved disciple, to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Who is the book of Revelation? Who is the book of Apocalypse? Who is it written to? And the answer is, it was written to you. It was not written to Hollywood. Hollywood has borrowed from this book. They've made all kinds of movies about aspects of stories within this book, oftentimes completely out of context. This book that reveals how the story ends was written to the church. Let me say it again. It was not written for the unbeliever. It was not written for the person of the world. This book was written to build hope and faith within the hearts of people that follow the Lord Jesus Christ. What was John's purpose in writing this book? It just said it's to record everything that Jesus said and showed. He was to write down everything he saw and everything he heard. He wasn't writing a new novel or a bestseller. He wasn't setting down, creating storylines or borrowing from myths. He was simply writing down things he saw and things he heard that Jesus said. When did John, the beloved disciple, write this book, this letter? The answer, he was 95 years of age. Imagine that, the John that I know was a fisherman. 
He was probably about 25 years of age, maybe 27. Before he reached 30, the man that he was following, Jesus, was crucified. He knew Jesus for three years. He knew his teaching. They called him rabbi. They called him miracle worker. The, the Jesus that John the apostle knew in his 20s was the miracle working Jesus, the anointed one, the Messiah, the great rabbi or the great teacher. Then, just before he turned 30, I'm speaking of John, he would now know Jesus as the Lamb of God, the one that gave his life on the cross. In a few days, he would know Jesus as the resurrected Savior. And then he would know Jesus 40 days later as the one that ascended to be at the right hand of the Father. Now, let me bring you forward. Let's say John was about 30 years of when Jesus ascended to be with the Father. Now he's 95 years of age. He's, he's in exile on the island of Patmos, which is just on the east side on the Aegean Sea of Greece near Turkey. He's 95 years of age. 65 years have gone by. And now he knew Jesus in a way that he had never known before. John knows Jesus. John knew Jesus as the miracle worker. John knew Jesus as the rabbi teacher. But look with me and discover with me in verse number 5 how he now knows Jesus. Jesus is a faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead and the ruler of the kings of this world. This is the Jesus I know. All glory to Jesus who loves us. John knows Jesus deeper than what he did and what he said, he knew Jesus is the one that loved him. I've been to Gibson Ranch many, many times. I've walked down those aisles where the horses are being cared for and pastures that are fenced. Oftentimes when there's a newbie or a stranger that comes to the ranch, the horses will flee it was really an odd experience because I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. They're not my horses and I don't feed them. And yet, they know me and they come to me. They know me in a different dimension. And that's what I'm writing and saying about John here in this verse. They knew John. John knew Jesus in a way that Jesus loved him. He knew him because he freed him from his sin and he shed his blood. These are the things that we've discovered in John in the way that John's relationship with Christ had grown and become deeper. But we also discover that Jesus knew John. And here in these chapters and verses, chapter 1, verse 7, he knew Jesus, and Jesus knew John and told him he was coming through the clouds. Look at verse number 8. I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning, and I am the end. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. I am the Almighty One. John does know Jesus, and Jesus does know John. In verse number 9, it says, I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering and in God's kingdom in the, in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony. Verse 10, it was the Lord's day. And I was worshiping the Lord. I was worshiping in the Spirit. 
when suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice. It was like a trumpet blast. Where were you on Sunday? Where were you last Sunday? Where was John? Where was John on the Lord's Day? Where was John on Sunday? Where was the apostle? And the answer is, he was in the Lord's sanctuary. He was in the presence of the Lord. He was worshiping in the Spirit. Ponder how many times in the Bible, and it's very interesting, that God will just reveal himself to somebody wherever they're at. Jonah was in the belly of the whale, and and God said, I'm in here too. Hello. (laughs) Hi. Paul was on the road to Damascus, and he was arresting and killing Christians. And Jesus said, why are you persecuting me as he revealed himself? So many examples in the Bible of God just showing up, invading somebody's life. Abraham was watching reruns of live streaming Netflix when God showed up and said, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Abraham wasn't seeking God and Jonah was running from God and Paul was arresting and killing followers of God. And still God seeks them out. But the reality is there are more examples of the Bible where people are actually seeking God. They're not like Jonah running from God. Consider Moses. Moses hiked to the top of the highest peak in that region, Mount Sinai, several times. And why did he go to the top of the mountain? Because he was seeking God. Consider David. David, who wrote the Psalms, almost all of them, in 150 Psalms, he wrote many, many of them. And where did that all come from? Because he constantly was in the sanctuary of God. David loved the temple. He was always going to the temple. What am I saying? I'm saying there's more examples of Scripture of men seeking God, men finding God, men going after and saying, I want to hear from God. It was Moses that went to the top of the mountain. It was David that went to the temple, and it was the early believers that went to the upper room to do what? To watch Netflix or Hulu or whatever? No, they weren't live streaming anything. They were seeking the face of God in the upper room. I wrote in my prayer journal this morning as I was walking past the horses, if you want to hear from God, understand that God wants to hear from you. If you want to hear the voice of God, God wants to hear your voice too. Thank you for joining Antelope Christian Center. We believe in the power of worship and the power of foundation of faith upon God's word. Our vision and our ministry is built upon loving God and loving others.